named Lisa Daniels. She lives in Chicago and whose son, Darren, was shot and killed. She had two sons, the younger one, Darren. She describes him as he was kind of a wanderer, and despite everything she did to try to keep him on that straight and narrow, by age 16, he was selling drugs. And on one day, he goes and buys some marijuana, though it looks like he had intentions of robbing the drug dealer. And the drug dealer, it seemed, had intentions also of simply taking the money and not giving them drugs. The drug transaction takes place in a very small, confined area. The three people are in a car, Lisa describes. There's Darren and his friend, and then this small-time drug dealer. And they get caught in a gunfight. And Darren ends up getting killed. Lisa finds out first from Darren's friends, and her first response and instinct is anger. She lashes out at them and says that this is what you can expect if this is what you're involved in. Now everybody is upset. She's also very angry because the newspaper report that comes out about Darren's death is primarily or exclusively about his race and criminal background. So how does a mom, or a friend, or a community respond to the aftermath of such violence? Lisa caught my attention because she took our tradition of grace, given through Moses, and given through Jesus, and given to us, and she makes it super relevant to her. The court case gets a little bit complicated because the lone witness has a criminal background. But the state's attorney goes to Lisa and says that they could possibly reach a plea deal. Would she be agreeable? She agrees on one condition. Her condition is that she's allowed to read a statement. Lisa gives this really incredible statement that I'm going to read to you that has been broadcast again and again over social media. This is what she says in the court. I have and will always continue to speak on Darren's behalf, but today I speak for Michael Reed because the truth is that things could have gone differently that day. And this young man, Michael, could have just as easily lost his life. And Darren would be sitting in the seat, needing somebody to speak on his behalf. I am a mother, and I know the heart of a mother. So I will speak from a mother's heart for a child who made a horrible choice. I don't know all the details of the encounter between Darren and Michael on July 22nd, but there are two things I know for sure. The first one is that no matter what he did, the choices he made, he did not deserve to die that day as a result of those choices. The second thing I know for sure is that this young man does not deserve to spend another year or minute behind bars as a result of his poor choice. Darren is not coming back, and 15 years of this man's life is not going to change that. And so I ask your honor to be lenient to this young man. Lisa preached the gospel that day, desiring leniency for Michael. She certainly does not want him to be cut down. She knows there's no victory here. Instead, she devotes her work and her voice to extending grace. God is not interested in cutting us down, but is interested in always extending grace. And I don't know if Lisa's witness of grace had any impact on the sentence. But Michael Reed, we have a video of it, on his way, out of court. After hearing her sentence, he turns around, he's handcuffed. He turns around and he puts his hands in a prayer and he mouths the words, 
think. Lisa has, re has started a restorative justice group, which is the opposite of punitive justice, with a vow that the group can do all they can to get Michael out of prison. This graciousness is astounding, right? That's why it drew my attention. And it's the work that we need to do. Jesus in today's gospel is not in a judicial court, but he is with people also very distressed by all the violence and all of the trauma and all of the injustice by the enslavement of people. The first century has similar violence, terrorism, economic hardships, biases against tribal groups. And very soon, we are going to, getting back in the historical context, we are just about to get into the first Jewish revolt that's leading to the second Jewish revolt. These are the bloodiest in our history. The tensions are quite high, and people are, are, are crying, are, are screaming, are, are bewildered. What do we do with all of this violence? People are looking to Jesus. How do we carry on? You know, these Galileans, this minority group, completely vulnerable, they're being terrorized simply by worshiping in Jerusalem. This violence is unending. It was reflected last week with Muslim worshipers in New Zealand. It persists you know, here with our redlining and our racial wealth gap, with the shooting of black men, with broken treaties, with our Multnomah and Chinook and Clackamas and indigenous peoples who have made their homes along our Willamette and Columbia Rivers. This ongoing cry persists. What do we do with all this violence? And it almost, almost makes a conversation about justice impossible. And it has certainly clouded conversations about race. And like my aunt, all of our ancestor Moses, I too sometimes hide my face hard to take in all this pain. So I'm thankful for our scriptures that Doris and Rebecca, come back Rebecca, read today that provide us with insight how God is helping us to be fruitful. Listen to how God responds to Moses again. With a lot of love, I am is saying, Moses, Moses, I see you, and I see how people are suffering. I see how the Egyptians oppress the people. So I am going to send you to Pharaoh, and I'm going to help you to bring people out of Egypt. The Exodus is this awesome example of how God is not ever cutting us down, but is extending grace. And the takeaway message here is grace. This is the framework, this is God's model to bring love and justice to all people. Jesus engages this model, grace, in his own particular way, as we're invited to do as well. He says, I need to tell you a story. He tells us a story. Look, there's a fig tree. This is us. We're the fig tree. It gets planted among the grapevines, and after a while, the vintner comes to collect figs. It's gotten big. We can expect there's going to be figs on it. Although, the vintner doesn't find any figs. And he thinks, if it's not producing, then we ought to cut it down. It doesn't deserve to be here. It's wasting space. Ouch. This punitive thinking, it creeps into all of our consciousness. It is a logic, I understand. But before the vintner acts, he does something really wise, and he calls in the expert gardener, Jesus, the Son of God, whose response is utterly different. He says, I know this tree. 
I will be with it. And I will help it. You know, I will dig around and loosen up that hard soil. I can fertilize it with good food. And maybe next year we'll find things on it. God's not interested in any punitive judgment. God's judgment is to fill in the cracks of our brokenness with gracious love. God's judgment is to fill in the cracks of our brokenness with gracious love. Giving us more time, second chances, more grace again and again and again. And I admit that I am completely convinced about God's ability to redeem our mistakes, mistakes done to us, the violence that we have done and that has been done to us, and all of our stuff by giving us grace. And I think that our part of this grace model of forgiveness is to be more open to the fact that we've made Heirs, that we have stuff. Maybe your pain and your stuff is really big. Maybe it's small. But there's something in us that we feel powerless over or that we feel like has a hold on us that we don't have much choice in. We feel like We've lost an ability to even choose. To choose to be in this relationship, to think this, not think this. That there's an element of our lives of unmanageability. And maybe this is just the human condition. I don't really know. And perhaps some people don't have stuff. But I honestly have not met a single person who doesn't. How do we carry on? I look to Jesus. To me, the greatest revelation of who God is, is Christ on the cross. And we are preparing. Lent is all about preparing to turn to God. We are preparing for Holy Week. It's coming. And we are going to soon know all the details about the cross about Pilate and Herod and the rabbi and the peoples who are not gracious to Christ. And we hear that the Son of God, in the face of deception and violence and death, is going to choose the cross. It's almost like God is saying right there at that moment, I would rather die than be in this sin accounting business that you've all kind of put me in. And from the cross, we pay attention. He grabs our attention, right? That grace, it calls us. And what does Jesus say from the cross? Forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. My grace, I give you. My grace, I leave with you. This is an eternally valid statement for me. God's judgment upon us is grace. If God could bear that kind of suffering with the only response of forgiveness and grace, well, that is the God who is present in the terrorist attack, in the flooding, in the room with an abused child. God is bearing that suffering with us. Not causing it, but extending grace, being in there with us and inviting us to extend that grace to ourselves and to each other. God's framework is grace. This is the model to bring love and justice to all people. Grace. In Hebrew, chetnun. In the dictionary, grace, unmerited love with a feminine beauty. Unmerited love was with the Israelites in enslavement. Unmerited love 
transformed their complaining. Unmerited love rose up Moses to be a confident leader and bring people out of Egypt. Unmerited love is what the compassionate mom, Lisa, wanted so badly for her son. Unmerited love is what Michael, her son Shooter, is looking for. Grace is what we all want so badly. And it's what we're all given daily. So how do we make it super relevant and personalize grace? That's my question to you. So to be fair, my turn. The first time I really knew grace, I was 21 years old. It was a summer that I had spent volunteering with Mother, Home, Mother Teresa's Home for the Dying and Destitute in Delhi, India, where I spent every day dressing wounds of women um, who were victims of violence. And the work left me pretty empty. So when you're empty and you're in India, what do you do? You go to a Buddhist center and you sign up for a three-day meditation exercise. And I really thought this was a good idea. <laughs> Although I had never meditated in my entire life and I signed up for three days. <laughs> and you know what meditation is, right? It, it's sitting. It's sitting. Did you hear me? I said three days of sitting. Can you imagine me sitting for three days? Um, it was horrible. <laughs> Not only did my body ache, uh, I was really, really cranky. This is hard work. I prayed. I prayed. I thought a lot about all of the underbelly of life. And I cried, and I went to some dark places, and it hurt. And I kind of experienced a death, perhaps. I became really afraid that I was hurting myself. Did I tell you that all I was doing was sitting and sitting and sitting? <laughs> but then there was a moment. This was my grace moment. There was a moment that I realized that I wasn't thinking a whole lot. And I realized that it was time to stand up. I stood up, and no one was in the room, like everyone had left. And my clothing and my face was drenched with sweat and tears. And I knew, like I knew, that I had let go of something major. It may have been control or shame, perhaps. I actually don't know what I let go of, but what I do know for sure is that my heart that was like stone was now more fresh and it was pure. And I felt ready to make decisions. I felt free to make choices. Death, resurrection, this is the Christian life. Within days of that meditation, I moved to Seattle. I started a new job as a special education teacher at King Elementary. I started dating my soon-to-be husband. I began the discernment process to become an Episcopal priest, and I was ready for all of that. Grace is always coming. It's inter inter interrupting our lives, yes. It often is digging around to loosen up that hard soil. It's inviting us to accept it for ourselves and also to give it to one another because perhaps next year we'll produce fruit. Where is grace in your life? You don't know right away, look to Jesus, the extremist of love, who didn't teach perfection, but taught participation. Participate in this life of caring for each other.
for decreasing violence, for helping people out of poverty, for pleading leniency in the courts, for making justice not punitive but restorative. Grace is here, and it's time to get to work helping each other produce fruit. And I know you know how to do this. So today, we are going to move into Holy Communion, and that's to receive the promise of God's love. As you do, um, we set up some oil, and it's blessed, and it's fragrant, and it's ready for you. So when you come up, I invite you to do something new. I invite you to receive the oil. And if you would like to think about Christ, put the cross on your forehead. Think about his words on the cross. Let that fragrance remind you that you are blessed. And let that blessing be to you the reminder that God is tilling in you and fertilizing you with encouragement and companionship and is mending those broken pieces that make us broken and beautiful and holds us together. God has given us grace, and grace is what we give.